We're in an historic drought, and that demands unprecedented action. It's for that reason that I'm issuing an executive order mandating substantial water reduction across our state. As Californians, we have to pull together and save water in every way we can. This executive order, which I've signed today, it's long. It uh, covers a number of different details. In fact, I've never seen one quite like it before. That, of course, Governor Jerry Brown of the great state of California announcing something that is fairly unprecedented, if not completely unprecedented in California, a mandatory water reduction designed to get Californians to use 20 to 25 percent less water. Think about that. Here to discuss this and to fill us in more on what we can expect in California, Joe Bastardi, chief forecaster for Weatherbell Analytics and the former chief meteorologist at AccuWeather. Joe, you are on top of this. You've been predicting this for a while. Tell us where we stand in California. Well, this uh, this pattern back in 2005-2006, uh, after the big hurricane season, I said uh, the southern part of the United States was and, and California was going to start getting dry because the Pacific was going to flip its cycle. And this was well known to uh, a lot of us uh, in the field that they were, were about the Pacific, what we call the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, was going to switch from its warm phase to its cold phase. And when that happened, what happens is the amount of uh, water vapor that is over the deep tropics in the Pacific, and you may notice that the uh, what we call the Global ACE Index, the Hurricane Index, has gone down in the tropics quite a bit. That decreases, and that that rich moisture that they need gets cut off, uh, and it's a, it's a 15 to 20, 25-year period. Now, the good news is over the next year, what is evolving now is very similar to the late 1950s and the late 1970s, where they had a real bad drought, for instance, in 76, 77, like we did this year, and you saw the winter turn out similar to that, very warm in Alaska, all the way into the western part of the United States. The east got brutally cold. But the second year after that, and you're going to start seeing this in California, next 9 to 12 months should average wetter than normal, not only in California, but through the southwest and the southern part of the United States. I say that's good news. It'll dent this thing for a while, but overall, decadally, we're in a dry period in California and the pro and all across the South. And the problem with that, too, is there are a lot more people living in California now and across the southern part of the United States than we had before. So the, the swings back and forth that we believe are natural and that you see are going to have more impact now because there are more people golfing, more people using water for their gardens and things like that. So it's a, it's a, it's a prudent thing, I think, that the governor is doing out there and uh, we probably have different beliefs as to why it has to be done. But naturally, we are in this cycle for quite a, t quite a ways to come. Hi, Joe. Uh, we've seen a lot of headlines where the global warming alarmists are attributing this drought to global warming. But one, one word you used a bit earlier I was hoping you could elaborate on, and that it's really cooling that may be causing the drought. Yeah, that, in, in the general sense, over the last six, seven years, the Pacific has cooled. And when that happens, this year it's starting to warm back up again. We have an El Nino that's evolving. And when you get these two-year El Ninos, it evolves slowly. The second year, and you can just go back and look at 76, 77, and 77, 78, what happened in California and across the southern part of the United States, uh, you'll see it get wet across California. And it's amazing that computer models look like 1977, 1978 now. They say uh, what happened was after the very bad drought, the dry winter of 76, 77, started raining quite a bit across the south in April, and that continued right through the following winter. And we're already looking at the following winter, this winter coming up in the United States. Like last year, we said in April it was going to be bad. I think it's going to be bad again this year. But getting back to where we were, when you look at the United States precipitation, it's when the Pacific is warming and the globe is responding to the warming of that tropical Pacific that we see more precipitation in the United States. So we had that in the 80s, the 90s, the early 2000s. And then when it started to cool, it goes the other way. You can't believe how close the so summer is. Joe, you're just, you're just full of good news. <laughs> what about the wine crop? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. We only got about, about 10 seconds, Joe, but I hear this is going to be good for California wine. It is because in the El Nino years, look at 06, 07, 09, 10, and now Quickly. coming up, 
California Napa wines, the red wines usually good. do All right. better. Good. Joe, I got to let you go. Joe <laughs> Bastardi, we'll do it again. I hope you'll have better news next time. Coming up next, more of the Steve Malzberg Show. But first, Old Ebbett Grill, founded in 1856, is just steps from the White House and was a favorite for many of our presidents. Let's take a, a look back at this historic restaurant with this hour's American Place. It's called the Old Ebbett Grill, just around the corner from the White House. William E. Ebbett purchased this building at the corner of 14th and F Streets in Washington, D.C. in 1856. He named it eponymously Ebbett House. The Ebbett House was later rebuilt and became one of the district's most fashionable hotels. But the hotel's restaurant, the new Ebbett Cafe, was the talk of the town. President Ulysses S. Grant and President Andrew Johnson dined frequently. Grover Cleveland, Teddy Roosevelt, and Warren G. Harding enjoyed evening drinks here. Washington's oldest saloon was born. During America's Prohibition years, it didn't matter Ebbett Grill was a stone's throw from the Treasury Department and its anti-bootlegger enforcers. Ebbett Grill became part of Rum Row, a strip of bars which were allowed to continue serving alcohol. The old Ebbett House is long gone, having been raised to make way for the National Press Club building. Today's old Ebbett Grill dates from 1983, when it was relocated after several moves. But the interior was designed to replicate the original. Some of the eatery's animal trophies are rumored to have been bagged by Teddy Roosevelt himself. And this carved wooden bear has a secret. We have a wooden bear behind the bar that belonged to Alexander Hamilton. So that's over 200 years. It's a hollowed out bear uh, where he hid his liquor bottles from his wife. A special bar dedicated to patron Ulysses S. Grant features Civil War relics. Old Ebbett Grill continues to make history. A Soviet spy ring was exposed operating from within its walls. Today, Old Ebbett is one of the top five highest grossing restaurants in America. From the old bar to the oyster bar, Grant's bar to the corner bar, visitors can sit back, bite into one of the city's best burgers, and discover a little history too. I'm Lucy Celia, and this is An American Place on Newsmax TV.